Good morning and welcome to CSI TV. This has been one of our exceptional conferences, the CSI 2018 in Mumbai. I am Dr. Uday Jadav. I work with the cardiology department at the MGM New Bombay Hospital in Mumbai. I have with me two of our very eminent faculty and very eminent personalities in the field of cardiology, Professor Dr. K.K. Sethi and Professor Dr. Sawani. Let me welcome them and start with their feelings about how did you find the CSI 2018 Mumbai so Society, what has been your experience over the last three days? I think it's been a great conference and after many years, I've seen a very well coordinated and a very well organized conference. And that goes to the teamwork of the people working in Bombay under leadership of Professor Satyavan Sharma and all the colleagues and also the coordination with the scientific committee team who were also present in very responsible positions during this meeting and were coordinating with each and every faculty to make sure that the sessions run on time and the content of the meeting is maintained to the international standards. So that's a very welcome change that has happened in management and the new uh, standards have been set by Mumbai. And I think all the other subsequent conference organizers should learn from here and try to professionalize the meeting as much as possible. Dr. JPS, uh, how do you think about the CSI TV? This has been an exceptional thing that has yeah, come through now. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very, very important because this gives us a message to very important topics have been selected, which I've seen in the last two to three days, and which have given a clear take home messages to our fellow colleagues for the management of various cardiovascular diseases. And this, I believe, has been also going to be put in on YouTube. So more of the people, those who are not able to attend this meeting, they will be getting the uh, the messages from our colleagues through CSI TV. I think it's very, very good. And in future, we should continue to have CSI TV in future CSI meetings also. So great. Let me start with the guidelines. So as you are all aware, the ACCHA guidelines were released in Chicago uh, a month back. And therefore, there has been a lot of interest which has been evoked all over the world. Let me start with uh, first as to what is it that the guidelines have re-emphasized what we already known and Dr. Sethi, what do you think is the new input for us? I think uh, I personally believe that the guidelines have basic framework has been kept the same as was there in the previous guidelines in terms of how we look at cholesterol, how much reductions are to be made, etc., etc. But what has been come to emphasize now is to look at the risk profile of the patient. For a practicing clinician, that's a very, very important thing. And the guidelines from the United States or Europe have always said that people more than 40 years of age should be viewed more seriously as compared to those who are younger. But here I would like to put my own view that in our country or in other countries of South Asia, the intensity of the coronary artery disease is much more as compared to the western population and coronary artery disease occurs at a younger age. So I would think that we should start looking at people earlier than 40 years to apply these guidelines, perhaps from the age of 30, start looking at their risk profile, perhaps even at a younger age, maybe from 20s onwards, if we have to reduce the long term exposure to risk factors and try to decrease the incidence of cardiovascular disease. So that's my first message that I would like to give. And after that, we can go on discussing as to how do we identify these people and how do we use medicines or other things to reduce lipid levels to optimum. Interestingly, even in patients who have a low atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease risk, I think this is the first time that the guidelines have highlighted that the South Asian ethnicity itself is a risk factor and therefore we need to look at it carefully and not just essentially go by the ACVD risk but look at the ethnicity and in patients with LDL uh, levels which are elevated we want to treat those patients. Now that's relevant uh, Dr. Son in the younger patients. I mean you have worked uh, uh, over the years or in the field of familial hypercholesteremia and I think there has been so much positivity about literature. Nothing comes through in our country in terms of how we can put that literature together and we are, we are sure we'll be seeing many more patients once we know the way of detection. 
Can you please highlight it because you are coming out with recent papers. Yes, yeah. We have recently had publication in Indian Heart Journal about the familial hepatoplasmia we, we all know is the most common metabolic disorder of genetic origin. There are two varieties, homogenesis is rare, but metrogenesis is quite common. The present data shows that approximately 1 in 250 the population, general population has the prevalence of this disease in the society. So what we are finding, that we used to think that probably FH is a rare condition, but we have found that probably we are wrong. We don't look for it, that's why we miss it. So now we have uh, used in our two papers the Dutch Lipid Clinical Network criteria, a simple criteria just like Chadwell's score for the atrial fibrillation management. The, this criteria has been simplified now and we have used that criteria to diagnose FH in clinical practice. So what we found, we looked for the young MI patient, less than 55 men or less than 60 women. We get two points for that. So is it, this criteria is based on, on point system. If point is 8 and more, it is definite. Between 6 to 8 is probable and 3 to 5 is possible. So above 5, that means 6 to 8, are generally we have validated that these points with the genetic testing using at the DNA mutation at PCSK9, LDL receptor, and APOB, and found around 70 to 80 percent the validation was seen. So what we use this criteria that if a young MI comes to us, we have two points. If you look into the detailed family history of similar nature, any vascular disease in the family, first degree or second degree relation, then we get one more point. Then we look at the lipid profile, the LDL. If the LDL is more than 55 to 190, it is one point. Beyond 190, it is three point. Beyond 250 is five point. So we add these points. And then we look into the physical examination of the patient. The tendon gentamas are rare in heterozygous, but arcus corneales, less than 45 years of age, we found in our study in 50% of the patient. is a usual finding which is missed because we don't lift the upper eye weight. So that gives you four points. So if we add all these points, probably we'll get a lot of patients. So the problem is that around 20% of the patients in our study, they were already on statin. So how to have this LDL level of statin nape situation? So there is an adjustment factor which is now available to us for various statins in different doses. We apply that and get the pre-statin level of the LDL. It may not be very accurate, but gives you a rough estimation. So using this four or five criteria, we'll phenotypically or clinically come to diagnosis that this is a potential FH patient. So in our two studies which we did, one of these which just published now, in 635 patient of premature CAD, 15% of the patients were having premature, I mean they are having family hypoglycemia, both the definite and probable group. The other study which we did on 100 patients where we did the genetic mutation in these patients, so the index cases what we found that more than 80 to 85% of the definite group have genetic mutation, around 50 to 60% from probable group. And then what important of this FH is that if we are identifying one FH patient, so we are not treating one patient, we are treating a family. Absolutely. That is very important. We are saving three or four more lives in that, in that family. So casket screening of the patient should be done in a proben or an index patient, looking at the siblings or their children by doing the non-fasting lipid profile or if possible genetic testing. So in our study, out of 134 family members, 95 people they came positive in genetic testing right. and 6 out of them were less than 16 years of age and we have to put them on statin or even younger age. So, so it's all is. it's all clinical, you yeah. just yeah. have the lipid profile and the yeah. clinical and you can yeah. pick up a lot yeah. of patients. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Dr. Sethi. Can I make a point here? Yeah, yes please, yes please. I think uh, what Dr. Sani has said is uh, quite right but I would like to add here that what has been studied by their group at this time is all patients who have already suffered a coronary artery disease. Now that brings us to the question of secondary prevention in these cases when the damage has already been done and you look at the families of these patients where possibly primary prevention tools are applicable. Much more challenging would be to identify people before they get their myocardial infarction because that should be the ultimate goal and for that we need to improve our screening methods perhaps start looking at lipid profile of people at a younger age as I was suggesting maybe the age of 20 years could be a good cutoff but at least at 30 rather than doing it at 40 years as suggested by the uh, western guidelines and that will be important for us because we already have a risk of premature coronary artery disease on the top of that mm, genetic uh, or familial dyslipidemia uh, is a fairly prevalent condition and we, we need to be a little more serious about it. 
the, the, when you see what Dr. Sethi said, right, uh, now the new guidelines have emphasized right. that 9 to 11 years may be the time when they are now suggesting to go for the lipid profile estimation again from 90 to 21 years. And therefore, that if the younger children are having high cholesterol, do a reverse cascade screening of the patient, of the parents, and look into that, and that's how we can identify a family and hypercholesterol in the society. Right. So, I mean, this will have to be taken in, in the adolescence phase and in high schools and colleges where we can pick up this hypercholesteremia and look at the population. Exactly. So, I, let me get back to one of the basics, which is uh, a part of the guidelines. We don't have any more the low intensity statin. So, we have moderate and high. Can you please define as to what is a moderate intensity and what is a high intensity statin in terms of? Basically, moderate intensity and high intensity statins are classified by the dose of statin that we use. And uh, modern day statins are quite potent as compared to the ones which we used to have earlier. The two major ones used in our country are Atova statin and uh, Rosova statin. And Atova statin uh, above the a a dose of 20 milligrams per day would be considered you know moderate to high above 40 milligrams per day actually is a high dose uh, statin but basically the principle on which you decide this is a dose of statin that would reduce ldl cholesterol by 50% is considered a high dose and the one which reduces uh, ldl cholesterol between 30 and 49% would be considered a moderate dose of a statin so having said that one should also understand that this is not a rigid rule because you initially calculate how much percentage of LDL cholesterol reduction you need in a particular individual and then you can start with that particular dose, let us say 20 milligrams of atorva statin or even some people 40 milligrams but you may not be able to get the desired result of 30 or 50 percent in which case you may have to increase the dose of statin. Similarly for rosuva statin above 20 milligrams is a high dose of rosuva statin because it is twice as potent as the tova statin and one can go up to 40 milligrams of rosuva statin if required. Dr. Sony, I mean, we know that these guidelines have come up with a few new things, add-on thing. One of them is, you know, in the past, the ACCHA guideline never really defined a level. So, they said you just use a modest or high-intensity statin, get the LDLC down, and don't worry about the LDLC goals. And now we have this, uh, uh, some sort of definitions in terms of uh, numbers which have come. So, we say LDLC reduction less than 50%. LDLC less than 70 milligram per deciliter. So when you put it all together in secondary prevention, you will aim at a goal. Is that what the yes, guideline yeah. says? That's what the guideline says that at least less than 70. Now that this new guideline has also added, besides what Dr. CT is saying, the high dose of statin. Now they say if the labels are not achieved, then there's a class 2A indication to add non-statin drugs like azitamide, 10 milligram. And if the still levels are not reached to the desired level less than 70 or 50 percent of the, the uh, uh, predetermined level of the LDL in a given individual, then PCSK9 inhibitors, which are now available to us in our country, by right, this is also can be added to such group of patients based on the recent clinical trial like four years and ODC. So these two new drugs have been now added for the management of this patient. And the male, the, they have classified patient into two groups, high risk population and very high risk population. So very high risk population are those who are probably need to have their cholesterol level below 50 even in such situations. Yeah, but uh, when we discuss the PCSK9, I think it's important to understand what the guidelines also say, that we will have to use a good dose of statin, high dose of statin, and then look at the ACVD risk. And then if the ACVD risk is high and you are unable to get the LDLs less than 70, then you should add a PCSK9. So PCSK9 is not simply a substitute or alternative for high dose statin. Uh, Professor said even azitimibe has got a, a little mention in the guidelines. What are your thoughts? See, my first comment on this is that for every patient that we see, particularly for a secondary prevention, we need to risk stratify the patient. And there are certain high risk markers which can be clinically judged. Somebody with atherosclerotic disease there is no need to apply a risk score. He is already a risk, high risk individual. And if somebody, even somebody has had a treatment and has received some dose of statin, those with diabetes, those who are smokers, those with chronic kidney disease, and those with hypertension, 
continue to be at very high risk of recurrence of events to the tune of more than 30% in the next 10 years in spite of getting a statin therapy. So that is something we must understand that risk stratification of the patient can be done by simple clinical tools. For example, presence or absence of diabetes. If somebody is smoking, he becomes a very high risk individual and in smoking I would like to emphasize any use of tobacco because in our country a non-cigarette or non-BD tobacco is also you know, used very, very frequently in society. So that's having done that, then you see how much statin the person is getting and have we been able to reduce the LDL to levels of less than 70 milligrams per cent. But if somebody is at a very high risk, one can go even lower than 70 because even if you are at 70, you still have a high risk. Now it is at this point in time that if the patient is already on a high dose statin or he is on a moderate dose statin and beyond that he is unable to tolerate statin because of side effects, one has to add a non-statin drug. And azetimibe has come handy in that uh, because it works from a different mechanism in the GIT and is quite effective in reducing the LDL cholesterol to the tune of about 23% from the baseline level that is available to you. If you double the dose of a statin, you get a 7 to 8 percent reduction in the LDL cholesterol. But if you add azetimibe, then you get certainly more than 15 percent, maybe about to the tune of 20 to 25 percent reduction in LDL over and above whatever the baseline level is. So that is where it is important because it is not important as to how we reduce the, the LDL cholesterol, but ultimately the level where we get is going to help the patient in the long run. We also have, Dr. Sawney, a lot of good information that has come. For example, if you have patients in uh, which the LDLC is between 70 and 169 and uh, they don't really have a very high risk and you want to assess the risk, then you can use certain parameters. For example, the coronary calcium score. And if the score is anywhere between 10 and 100, then you are justified in starting a modest intensity statins and if the score is above 100, coronary calcium score is a documentation of atherosclerotic plaque, it's a direct documentation. So, you have every reason to use that parameter in terms of starting statins. But uh, let me ask you a little different uh, sort of question here, that you have the LDLC in the guidelines between 70 and 169, it's quite a long range. And it said in the guidelines that if the patient does not have a ACVD risk, which is high, which is low, which is not even modest, which is low, then probably you may not start a statin, do a calcium score, and then discuss with the family and decide whether the statin should be initiated. So I spoke to Professor Dr. John Chapman yesterday with the same concern in India that if you have let's say a non-diabetic young patient whose LDL is 150, whose risk is not high, do you think uh, you will still defer statin therapy as you are a great proponent of getting statins early, do you think that this is too much of a range? You see, the, uh, my answer will be that in such situation that we look for the family history. If there is a family history of premature CAD or if he's been a smoker, LDL more than 160 what the guideline says, then we should start them on statin. But even patient has a calcium score zero with this three factor, smoking, family history and LDL more than 160, we have to still start statin. Between zero to 100 calcium score, I think the guideline says if a person is more than 55 years of age, then we should start statin, moderate doses. But if the score is more than 100, I think we should start statin. Then at the same time, in such risk population where low risk, I agree, but if there is an intermediate risk population, between 7.5 to 20, right. then probably we may have to take the account of the risk factor enhancer, which new guideline has given us now. And in that, they have looked into various factors like the CKD, the family history, LDL cholesterol. They look into the chronic inflammatory diseases like the joint problems, the rheumatoid arthritis, metabolic syndrome, Asian ethnicity. And so these are the various risk parameters, parameters which we have identified. Absolutely. If these are there, and also in women, they have said now that premature menopause or pre, uh, preeclampsia reduction, then we can go ahead with that. So let me ask you also additional small quick question. 
is there anything for women? I mean, this is a concern all over the all over the world now. They get CID early as you, as interventional cardiologists, you have the best experience on this uh, premenopausal or at the menopause. Uh, how do we address their lipids? Well, uh, the in this guideline, which has definitely there is a section for women. And they said there is a premature menopause, less than 40 years. Uh -huh. And is there a history of preeclampsia? Then probably these are the risk enhancer in a given situation. The patient has no ASVD, but for primary prevention, you look at the ASVD risk score and look for this enhancer in women. Probably they justify of using the, uh, the statin. But one should be careful in the uh, pregnancy period, statins are strict no no. They are contraindicated, we cannot use. Even in patients with FH, ladies, those who are going through pregnancy, we have to stop statin at least one to two months before the planning of pregnancy. Conception. Yeah, that's right. Can so, I add yes, something here? Sir, I think please. in women, there are some more issues which are important. Apart from uh, premature menopause, which Dr. Sani has uh, pointed out, or history of chronic joint disease or other things, one important factor that has always bothered me is polycystic ovarian disease. And these patients are very commonly associated with metabolic syndrome. So they are at high risk for developing coronary artery disease in future. Second, any hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, preeclampsia or otherwise, enhances the risk of future coronary events. And third, you know, family history, there is a critical point to be seen. If you have people with premature coronary artery disease in the family, for a woman, if there is a sister with premature coronary artery disease, the risk enhancement is much more as compared to a brother with coronary artery disease. So that is an important factor that is a special risk enhancer in women, which is not mentioned in the guidelines, guidelines but yeah. it is something that is, Absolutely. no, yeah. it is not experience, it is documented in the literature that these three things are very, very important. And uh, that is what I would like to do. So now let's uh, switch gear and go into a little different area, Dr. Swan. It's very interesting that we have been uh, anticipating that the guidelines would tell us something about triglycerides because that's been a concern in India. And we have been a bit uh, sort of, you know, uh, very sentimental about the way we want to deal with triglycerides elevated in India and the role of fibrates which have been used much more in this country than probably elsewhere on the globe. Uh, so the guidelines really have not uh, taken triglycerides at a higher level. So let me first uh, put the guideline recommendation that if the, if the triglycerides are elevated, you still look at the risk. And if the patient has an elevated triglyceride, that actually enhances the atherosclerotic risk and therefore there is a reason to upgrade the statin dose and go to a higher intensity statin. And thereafter you look at the triglycerides, deal it with uh, lifestyle modification and less than 400 mg per deciliter has not been really set to be addressed with a drug. And neither our popular drug, the fibroid group of drug, has been given any, any important class indication. So triglycerides have, if we go by the guidelines, need not be necessarily uh, dealt with in isolation. What are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Swani and then Dr. Sethi? Yes, uh, the, the new guidelines have clearly shown that if the triglycerides are more than 500 or 1,000 to prevent pancreatitis, the phenofibrate can be added this group of patients, but less than that, they say the lifestyle modification probably plays a major role, like control of diabetes, reduction of weight, exercise, reduction of alcohol, or even consuming less of carbohydrate food, That's right. and daily exercise, smoking cessation, tobacco cessation, all these factors may help us to reduce triglycerides significantly. So the guidelines are very clear that we need not have to touch with it, giving them any drug for that. But at the same time, guideline has said that we can use the, uh, the fish oil which has now uh, has been recommended as one of that to be used in this patient. And now we have a study called Reduce It Study, uh, which was used with a high dose of 2 gram twice a day of EPA, that the fish oil, to patient of cardio cardiovascular disease or diabetic patient with multiple risk factor. This is surprising. This study has shown a 25% reduction in the MACE, that means the myocardial infarction, stroke and, and the cardiovascular mortality. So this study has favored the use of fish oil 
but in a dose which has been recommended is 4 gram which is dose which we commonly don't use in clinical practice and probably this is also favoring to reduce the triglycerides in the sample because this population they looked at more than 135 to 500 499 triglyceride level in this population and they found reduction of triglyceride reduction of cardiovascular event in this population so, so these guidelines are definitely favoring the phenofibrate to be kept low as we say in our country the, the metabolic syndrome is high we have more tg less hdl so i think i will take the opinion of dr Seth so that this. that brings out a point and yeah. i want to ask this to dr Seth. do you wish to differ in any way uh, from the guidelines for the indian context absolutely i want to differ and yes. that's why i want to make my point yes <laughs> Uh, first thing I would like to add to what Dr. Sani has said so that we'll put that uh, fish oil business on the side. Uh, the study that has been recently published which has shown reductions uh, in event rates have not used the traditional fish oils which are available in the market. They have used a purified form which mainly contains eco-sepentanoic acid. So that is what is a refined form of uh, fish oil and we should be able to understand that but importantly the high dose of fish oil has to be used and most times when fish oils are taken by people as prophylactics they take very small dose maybe a thousand milligrams a day or even less and that is not effective that is one two as an individual having studied lipids for many years and I have been one of the earliest proponents of statins in this country I have always uh, been convinced that association of increase in the triglyceride levels has been atherogenic. Right. Whether or not it came in the guidelines, because by metabolism, you will see that the triglycerides produce triglyceride rich lipoproteins. And the, the metabolic products of these, you know, the VLDL is highly atherogenic. There is no question about that. And the intermediate density lipoproteins are, hypo, are atherogenic. And so are the remnants. Now, each one of them contains some degree of ApoB. ApoB is the major component that causes atherosclerosis and almost 90% of the uh, content of the LDL cholesterol is ApoB. 10% is, let's say, something like triglyceride. Now, as you go to the metabolism elsewhere, the intermediate density lipoprotein will have 50% of ApoB, 50% triglyceride, the VLDL will have let's say 30% of ApoB and 70% uh, of triglyceride. The chylomicrons will have 10% of ApoB and 90% triglyceride. But nevertheless, all of them put together, you know, you it's have that ApoB. Uh, and that is why when you have high triglyceride levels, the Friedwald formula becomes useless. And, and you need to measure the ApoB levels. Right. And if they are more than 130, you know the person is at high risk. So that is one thing which is very important to understand. And secondly, they produce, yeah. you know, uh, uh, what do we call? Uh, to okay. Yeah. So the LDL, the small dense LDL particles. So I, I guess what Dr. Sethi has said is, in the Indian context, we need to relook at triglycerides still uh, a little more carefully. So let me summarize the discussion that we all had in terms with the guidelines. So the guidelines do re-emphasize that you give a good dose of statin in all patients who have a established cardiovascular disease and you don't really have to worry about looking at all of the parameters get it down by at least 50 percent get it down to reasonably low levels and these low levels are not necessarily defined but they are safe after the pcsk9 inhibitor studies too that in patients who are at intermediate risk you look at all the other cofactors and morbidity and decide the risk in very low risk patient you might use parameters like calcium score or ApoB or a family history or uh, your ankle brachial index as mentioned in the guidelines and HSCRP and then take a call. Uh, it's important that in patients who don't tolerate statins very well then you can reduce the LDLC by 30 to 50 percent and still it's okay. Triglycerides when they are elevated enhance the atherosclerotic risk and there is a reason therefore to address the ASCVD carefully and increase the dose of statins. Use lifestyle modification first and then add a, a, a drug for lowering triglycerides as indicated, more to protect the pancreas. We don't have any mention on HDL in the guidelines, so we don't know what to do about it. We are still, it's still an enigma as it has always been in the past. And lastly, having said all this, 
what we are talking about is when you talk of severe hypercholesteremia as in the guidelines primary severe hypercholesteremia takes you to the same sort of lesson that we learn in this country is that when we look at premature CAD on the rise in this country it's very essential do the lipids early don't have to look at the fasting lipids you can you can do it random postprandial triglycerides are very important so do it at any point of time look at the risk the patient has and go on a high intensity statin get it down to less than 70 if you cannot mm -hmm. add a PCSK9 inhibitors in those with primary hypercholesteremia get it down to less than 100 and if you cannot then add a PCSK9 inhibitors it's been a great experience talking to two of our best experts in the country Dr. Sethi and Dr. Sawney both of them have done tremendous research and uh, I really feel this has been a great experience uh, from uh, CSI TV 2018 with an unrestricted educational grant from MQR. This has been a wonderful experience and have a nice time ahead in the remaining part of the conference. Thank you very much.